Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we have come into your presence this morning at your invitation. We do celebrate your goodness. We affirm your love, your generosity, your beneficence. And we pray that you will fill us with your spirit so that our lives will radiate the goodness of heaven. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we had a church and business session on Thursday night. And part of our assignment in that meeting was to, to discuss changes in the church's constitution and bylaws. And wouldn't you know it, there was a section in there where we disagreed. But fortunately, the church, at least in this instance, was able to rise higher than the norm in our culture. And we were able to discuss a constitutional matter, spend three or four minutes, and then go, eh, let's vote and move on. And we voted and moved on, and some of us lost. And we're still happy. The mark of human maturity, the sign that humans are moving toward God-likeness is a capacity to live in community. And by definition, living in community means living with people who think different, believe different, look different, act different. When you look around the world, at people, at countries splintering into smaller and smaller groups. I want a country that's everybody just like me. It never goes well. God calls us to this transcendence. Today's offering is, is a mark of our participation as a congregation in a community that is larger than ourselves. We're part of the Washington Conference, the Association of Adventist Congregations across Western Washington. This means that we are linked with congregations very different from us. And we're all in a community together. And, and there is no community that doesn't involve sharing money. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Until we share money, we are not really community. So I invite you to be generous today as you... Uh, money that's not marked otherwise, uh, the loose offering, uh, will go for the Washington, Washington Conference Ministries, an offering that is shared by Adventist churches across western Washington. Of course, those of you who mark it, an envelope, it'll go for whatever you put there, and you may also give online. I invite the deacons to stand. We'll ask God's blessing. Lord in heaven, thank you that you've called us into community and that you, you provide the capacity to connect with one another. Now, Lord, we pray that you will bless the money that is given today and, and through the week and through the month. May this money be an agency of the kingdom of heaven, a tool of goodness, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
so we used to have a great big dog. That dog weighed more than any of you kids that are up here. It was a huge dog. His head was, I don't know, maybe that tall. He weighed half a pound less than I do. I would eat dinner just so I could stay ahead of the dog. What? Now, this dog had a particular talent. Um, he made interesting noises. Um, he didn't bark very much, but he would cry, and he would sing, and he would talk, kind of dog talk. You know, he'd go, oh, 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 oh. Well, my son had a bright idea. This dog is very large. It likes to make noises, interesting noises. So my son thought, I wonder if I could teach this dog to sing. Do you have any idea what a dog singing would sound like? It's pretty funny. But he wanted to see if this dog would sing on command. So if we could say, Porter, sing. Well, you know what? He got Porter trained so that Porter would sing. But, you know, just one dog singing. I mean, that's interesting. Come on, girls. Hey, come on up here. Yeah. One dog singing would be interesting. But my son had a bright idea. What would be better than one dog singing? A dog choir. So, we had four dogs. We still have four dogs. Um, and most of those dogs like to sing. So my son would teach them to sing on command. My wife was not real happy about this. But I thought it was wonderful. So uh, you might want to turn the mic down, Tad. I'm, I'm going to do some dog singing, so um, be, be ready for this. So here's what one dog singing sounds like. Remember, the big dog. But that's only one dog. Could you guys be the dog choir? Can you howl like a dog? Try it. I, Liz is wrinkling her nose. She doesn't think she can do this. Um, Nicholas, can you help? Can you sing with me like a dog? Okay, here we go. Here we go. It goes. Oh, you don't want to do it? I'll have to sing it by myself then. Or maybe I'll get Brian Carla to help me. Uh, yeah. Oh, you'll help me? Oh, what? okay. I'm going to say that your name is, what's your real name? Rosalind. Pardon? Rosalind. I'm so happy you're here, Rosalind. So we're going to pretend your name is Rose because we have a dog named Rose who loves to sing. She sings even when we don't tell her to sing. Just like that. Okay, are you ready? So we're going to imagine I'm Porter, you're Rosie, and my son has just said, sing. Okay. Oh, that's good. Now, can we get somebody to be gypsy? Abigail, can you sing like a dog? No. no. All right. All right, it's, it's going to have to be Rosalind and me. We did a good job. Thank you, Rosalind. Now, in my sermon today, I'm going to talk about worship. And I'm specific, I'm talking about coming to church to worship. And part of the reason we come here is because it's, it's more fun to sing sometimes when you got a whole bunch of people singing than when it's just one. Even if you're as big as Porter was, you know, that huge, it still sounded better when Rosie and Gypsy and Clifford and Teddy joined in, and then it sounded like the whole universe was singing dog song. All right, you can grab your buckets and go collect the Hands Across the Water offering.
O Lord our God, merciful and mighty, our lives and our surroundings are changing so quickly. Some of the changes are so wonderful. We thank you for the birth of babies, for growing and maturing children, for our enlarging church, for this change of seasons with warmth and sunshine and growing crops, and for opportunities to travel while school is out. Other changes, particularly those we can't control, worry and upset us and horrify us. We worry about our jobs, about illness in our families. We grieve that our parents and other persons we love are aging. We sorrow that fire and water devastate lives. We despair that wars continue and that bomb bombs and guns maim and kill the innocent. We pray that you will send your comfort and your peace and that we, can, we will do what we can to alleviate the trouble. We pray for those in our congregation, particularly those mentioned in the bulletin, who are or will be soon under physician's care. We pray for Angie Abraham, for Charles Berthoff, for Scott Helfrich, and for Lillian Vulatek, Simona's mother. Please help them and, and everyone on our prayer list. We also pray for Wanda Griffith in this list. Please be with them, not only with them, but with the healthcare professionals treating them with their families as well. Thank you, Lord, for being the rock which doesn't move, for being the one who doesn't change. Thank you for being our anchor and that we are grounded firm and deep in your love. Thank you also for this community of, of believers who, because we have faith in you, try to act as you did in the world. Help us to be your hands working in this world and to support one another as you support us. Teach us to be sensitive to others' needs and to do appropriate things to meet those needs. Help us in our families, at church, in work groups, on committees, at work, and in our community. We pray that you'll give us insight to see opportunities and problems clearly, to know what we should do, and give us the energy and courage to accomplish those things. Thank you, too, that we can rest and be renewed in you because these tasks are lifelong. Help us to forgive each other as you forgive us when we sin and fail. And we look forward to the day when Jesus will come and we will see him face to face and we will continue to live in the light of your unchanging love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands.
Then, as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly, I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the thrones came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the sitter and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Kean thinks he has escaped, but I'm going to call him back up here. And Anley, somebody find Anley for me. I saw him here a few minutes ago. Somebody find Anley and tell him he is wanted at the front of the church. Anley Mozilla. <laughs> is he around? He was sitting right there earlier. Come on, Kean. Yeah. One of the meanings of worship is to give attention, to give attention to something that we admire, we appreciate, we value. Which means it's complicated because there's not one thing we value, not even one being we value. When Jesus was asked for the great commandment, he didn't give one, he gave two. And part of what we value here, Kian, is kids who go to school. And you were not here when we shared some congratulations with a whole group of other people. So, congratulations. Thank you. So, what are you off to next year? Mount Sai High School. Mount Sai High School. What grade are you going to be in? Ninth. Ninth grade. And here is the one who can explain to you what it is like to move through high school. All right. Anley graduated from high school, Nathan Hale High School. Um, he had some awards here. Top five varsity tennis. Who knew? Why, well, hey, cool. Um, he has an aerospace science and technology certificate. I'm impressed. Uh, that kind of fits 
Seattle, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, his hobbies and interests include art and design, technology, music, and sports. You sound like a fun guy. <laughs> yeah, all right, cool. Well, we have something to say congratulations from the church. And just before you run away, we as a congregation do this. We're honoring specific people. And those of you who were here when we did it a few weeks ago, Anley was not there. That was our bad. Anley was present, wondering, uh, no, look at all those people up there. We try hard, and we hope that when we blow it, you will forgive us and help us fix it. And Anley, we're glad you're here today so we could honor you and thank you for your education that you've been chasing and pray God's blessing on you as you move forward. Thanks, guys. I remember my freshman year at Southern Adventist University, the first Friday night of that year, sitting in the college church. In those days, it was Southern Missionary College. We had, it had not moved up to university. <laughs> and I remember sitting in the church on Friday night, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 people there. And you could feel the energy in the room, you know, all these young people just, ah, full of life and dreams, plans to change the world, you know, pursue grand careers. I was sitting there with my own dreams, been going back and forth. You know, medicine, specifically research in medicine, I wanted to study the physiology that lay behind, or, or the physiology of deep sea diving. I'd been watching too much Jacques, Jacques Cousteau, you know, and reading about him in National Geographic, and I thought that would be cool to study what happens in the blood when people live at depth. Or I was going to become a minister and save the world. Yeah, either one. I mean, grand dreams. And I already, I, I knew that these dreams, my dreams, were not mine in an individual sense. You know, my medical dreams were, were inspired by you know, the greats, Pasteur, Salk, Sabin. Ministerial dreams, I thought of standing in line with Fernando Stahl, the Adventist missionary who understood that speaking for God meant fighting for the rights and opportunities for the indigenous people of Peru. He was not content to talk about the hereafter and do nothing about here. Or David Livingston, you know, the crazy adventurer, explorer guy in Africa. Or Martin Luther, whose, whose work broke the stranglehold of the medieval ecclesiastical tyranny on Europe and opened Europe to to exploration of spiritual and intellectual thought in a, in a new way. I wanted to do something important, but whichever way I went, I would simply be one more cog in this grand wheel of humanity pushing, pushing forward in God's world. Sitting there in church, they sang a few songs, and then it was time for the opening song of the evening worship service. And it was for all the saints. I don't remember who the organist was, but you know, they pulled out all the stops. They shook the rafters. You know, bass just throbbed in the place. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess. Thy name, O oh Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia. And to hear a thousand or fifteen hundred young voices singing with that organ. This was as close to a Pentecostal experience as I've ever gotten in church. I was transported. The music somehow made real and alive that community of saints across the ages. That was worship.
When we come to church for worship, we come and we give attention to the grand ideals of our faith. We know what the world is like. We're aware of the pain and brokenness. We're not blind to that. But for a little while, we come here and we affirm our hope, which is beyond belief. We put the newspaper down. We turn off the radio. Shut down the internet. Which, for many of us, primarily feeds us with despair. A whole lot of us, when we go to the news, we look for the bad news, and it is not hard to find. You can go just over the mountains, that's just over the Cascade Crest, natural disaster that has devastated lives. And I don't even need to add the details. You know, you go farther afield, and the world is full of hurt. The hurt is real, it's massive, it's ugly. But we come here, and for a little while, together, we lift our hearts and we open ourselves again to the message of hope and triumph. God will win. And because God wins, humanity wins, we win. And it may be unbelievable, but here it's not. It may be unbelievable for me, and so I come and I sit beside you, and I listen to you sing, and I go, amen. I don't mean to be irreverent. We say to God, what he said, what she said, yeah, that. The the central act of the church is the affirmation of gospel, good news. <laughs> I was laughing. Um, I, was visit, I, I was in a doctor's office on Thursday or Friday, someday this week, um, getting a little bit of physical therapy. And the guy that I've talked to a few times, I've been there a few times, and um, he was talking about what was going to happen in church this coming weekend, he knew I was a preacher. I said, oh, I got my sermon done. I'm feeling pretty good, he said. And then he made some remark, and he had made a few others. And I I could tell that his notion of church was to go and get a good spanking. And he assumed that as a preacher, that was, you know, yeah, get everybody in, shut the doors, and then do this at you. And I finally said to him, I said, Patrick, wait a minute. What if when I came here today, you had looked at me and you said, John, you're so, you're so dumb. Why are you always slumping your shoulders forward? Why don't you pull them back like you're supposed to? Why? Yeah, he's, he's very good. He had given me some exercises to help me with some pains and stuff I had. And he hadn't scolded me a single time. And I said, Patrick, I'm here studying how to do ministry. And I hope when I go to church, I do what you do. I think the people who come are as eager for healing and help as I am sitting here in your office. He goes, oh, I never thought of that before. The purpose of church is not to spank the sinners who happen to show up. (laughs) The purpose of church is to celebrate the goodness of one who would rather die than live without us, the central claim of Christianity. However you interpret it, going beyond that, that's an astonishing, radical claim that the God of the universe would rather die than live without you. And we come here and we go, wow. May that begin to shape my life so that as I engage with others, their well-being goes higher and higher in my mind and my need to climb on top of them to reach something is diminished that's why we come and worship we celebrate the good stuff this week i was visiting this week last week sometime recently i was visiting with a young person who had lots of of hard questions 
about God, religion, and spiritual life. Uh, it, was a, it was a rich conversation. And at one point, he was talking about, you know, all these people are going to be lost, and he had a hard time with that. And I said, well, I don't have a hard time with it. I just don't believe it. What? I said, look, I'm a dad. I said to this person, you're a dad. I'm an older dad than you are. <laughs> a lot older. I said, which of my kids would I write off? I don't think I'm nicer than God. He goes, oh, you can't do that. You're anthropomorphizing. I could tell he was proud of that big word. <laughs> I said, guilty as charged. Yeah, I am. What Christianity shamelessly does is look at humanity and take the very best, the, the cream off the top of humanity and say, that's a pointer toward the goodness of God. The best dad who ever lived, eh, is a poor model for the real father. The best mother who ever lived, that's God, only God's better. <laughs> the most brilliant engineer, that's God, only smarter. The most generous philanthropist, that's God, only more generous. Christianity shamelessly anthropomorphizes. It looks at what we know best, which is ourselves, and says, find the best among us. Somewhere there in that neighborhood is where you begin to know God. And we come to worship, and we sing, Alleluia. I've done a series you know, on resources for spiritual life. It is certainly possible to encounter God in the mountains. We're going to do that this afternoon. It's possible to encounter God in Scripture. There's many places where we encounter God. There's many places where God encounters us. One of them is here. And the purpose of coming here, the supreme purpose, is to give attention again, not just with our intellect, but to give attention again with our entire being to the very best that we can understand of God, and to open ourselves so that that vision can begin to, to shape and fill us. At the end of the hymn, it talks about the warfare is fierce and long. Our arms can grow weak. And then it says, but in worship, our hearts are made brave again and our arms are strong. That's the fruit of worship. Alleluia. Alleluia.
Amen. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.